growing Australia's blue economy. Dr Whittington has a Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Adelaide, worked in the State University of New York, and back in Australia he worked for several universities and the CSIRO. He then spent a number of years in the public service, most recently as Secretary of the Department of Primary Industries, Parks, Water and Environment, which embraces a very large amount of Tasmania <coughs> and um, embraces the seas surrounding us. So I would like you to welcome our speaker, Dr. John Whittington. So thank you very much for inviting me here to speak today. It's a great honour. And um, as your president has introduced me, I'm John Whittington, and I'm the um, CEO of the Blue Economy CRC. Cooperative Research Centres are uh, a creature of the uh, Australian government, and there are many of them around Australia. The Blue Economy CRC was established two years ago. It started as a company in July of 2019. I came on board just at the beginning of COVID in February of uh, 2020. So I've been there about 18 months now. One of the things that I get asked a lot is, what is the blue economy? So I've taken this slide from the World Bank, and whilst you don't need to read all the words on it, I think that the, sort of the top line is sort of, um, sort of sets the scene. So the blue economy is the sustainable use, and sustainable is an important part of this um, description, sustainable use of the ocean's resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs, and ocean ecosystem health. And it encompasses many activities. <coughs> I won't be talking about all of the things that go on in the blue economy today. I'll be talking particularly around um, the management and planning of the blue economy. I'll be talking around some of the renewable energy opportunities in the blue economy. And I'll be talking about aquaculture um, in the blue economy. As I said, the blue economy in its entirety, though, encompasses all of those activities that can be done in our oceans. What I'd like to do is um, just give you a bit of a context to the blue economy and in the context of the sort of an international uh, policy context. And the United Nations um, back in 2015 established its agenda for sustainable development and through that it set up 17 goals. And these 17 goals for sustainable development are guiding or, uh, much of the UN's activity, but also many businesses, uh, many of our, particularly international businesses, will look to the, what they call them SDGs, or the Sustainable Development Goals, and show how they are contributing to those as part of their sustainability um, pathway as a company. Many of the UN's uh, SDGs are relevant to the blue economy and the work that I'm going to talk about, particularly conserving and sustainably using the ocean, seas and marine resources for sustainable development. So, and I've chosen a few other goals there that link to what we're talking about and there are many others that we could have chosen. But I've put this in there as a bit of a sort of a, you know, a bit of a headline about there is global interest and attention on sustainable use of the world's oceans. It is also the decade of ocean science that started um, this year and um, goes out to 2030. And this is again a United Nations construct and they've proclaimed it as the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And they see that this ocean science is a unifying framework to deliver on those UN objectives related to the ocean. We also have the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy. And the leaders of 14 countries have come together um, and they're um, investing in science in the oceans. They're, those countries, are, well, the leaders of those countries are on that little map down there, but notably, Australia is one of those 14 countries. There's been a lot of work being done by the High Level Panel and they put out various reports that are, if you're interested in, are, are, are certainly an interesting read. But one of the kind of the underlying things that they've said is that 
we want to be sustainably managing 100% of our nation's waters, those 14 countries. And in the context of Australia, that's a big ask. We've got the third largest um, economic EEZ or economic exclusion zone in the world. It is many, many millions of square kilometres. So I think when the Prime Minister made that commitment, I'm not quite sure whether he fully understood <laughs> the length and breadth of that commitment, but that is something that the Blue Economy CRC is definitely working towards. So this is just a, one of the, I'm just going to go through a couple of slides which I've taken from the um, high level panel. Um, as I said, they've put out a number of reports very early on in their life. These are fairly straightforward um, statements. Um, the ocean sustains much of the world's population. It helps stabilise the climate and can lead to great prosperity. But all is not well and wonderful in our oceans. And I'll come to some of those challenges in a moment. But what this high-level panel has, well, the science that was uh, uh, initiated by the high-level panel was to um, show that actually there's a lot of opportunity in the oceans as well. And that panel, and this, there's a fair bit of science that's gone behind this, have said that we can do six times more sustainable seafood, um, or sustainable food out of the oceans by 2050. That won't come from wild fisheries. About 90% of our wild fisheries stocks globally are either, either fished at their limit or overfished. There is very little capacity <coughs> to increase production from wild fisheries. That increase will all come from aquaculture. There's some modelling around employment, and I'll talk a little bit about employment today. They are saying that there's 40 times more renewable energy that could be um, extracted out of the oceans by 2050. Oh, that's, in my view, is probably a gross underestimate. Uh, there is vast potential for energy, renewable energy from the oceans, and I'll spend quite a bit of today talking about some of those opportunities. And there's talk of um, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. The panel, as I sort of gave this away a little earlier, committed to, and this is the Prime Minister of Australia amongst the 14 leaders, to sustainably manage 100% of the oceans under national jurisdiction guided by sustainable ocean plans by 2025. So not only are we going to be managing them, we're going to have a sustainable ocean plan, whatever that is, in the next four years. And whilst the blue economy didn't um, spawn out of this commitment, we were co the blue economy started prior to this commitment being made, we see the organisation that I work for fitting very closely into this space. So what is the Blue Economy CRC? We're a, an organisation that's been established to perform um, collaboratory, collaborative, industry-focused research and training that underpins the growth of the Blue Economy through particularly offshore sustainable aquaculture and in renewable energy production. We're actually a, a, a company limited by guarantee. We're a charity. Um, we have 40 participants that contribute resources into the Blue Economy CRC. And those, um, those participants range from uh, universities, UTAS being one of those, um, but there's probably more than 10 universities um, who are part of the Blue Economy CRC. It includes government research organisations. CSIRO is a participant in the Blue Economy CRC, for example, and similarly uh, the New Zealand equivalent. We have a number of aquaculture companies who are in the CRC. All three of the major Tasmanian salmon producers are in the Blue Economy. That's Hewan, Petuna and Tassal. New Zealand King Salmon is also a participant. Uh, the shellfish industry is represented through Oysters Tasmania. We have renewable energy companies who are uh, developers who are part of the Blue Economy CRC. So, and I'll talk about some of those companies as we go through the talk, but for example, in the wave energy space, we have a company called Carnegie Clean Energy. We have a tidal uh, generator, a company called Sabella, who are based in France. We have an offshore floating renewable developer, a company called Saitec, where their head, their head office is in Spain. Um, we also have a number of engineering um, companies that have a focus or at least have a significant part of their business in, 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 in oceans. And they include companies like BMT and Pitt and & Sherry. And then some of the classification societies are also part of, of the Blue Economy CRC. So quite a diverse group. We, is, we do five uh, major research programs. Um, 
in offshore engineering and technology, seafood and marine products. So um, how you would grow, how you do things out in the ocean is the first program. The second program is what you what you grow out there in the in the in the aquaculture space. We have a program on offshore renewable renewable energy systems. Then we have two programs that are focused around um, a, the sort of the non-engineering, non-biological side of of our business. One is around environment and ecosystems. Um, that's looking at how do you do this sustainably in the ocean. And then the sustainable offshore developments, looking much more at the regulatory environment and uh, that the um, and the planning environment that you um, do work in the oceans in. Now I'm going to touch on all different aspects of these as I go through the talk. This is uh, impossible to read, but it's to give you a sense. I've got these five programs and I'll be talking about aspects of work from each of these programs, but I won't try and cover all of them. I'll just try and stitch together a story to give you a sense of, of what we do. So, I'll move now to the sort of the first bit of the talk around some of the work that we're doing. And this is around, well, what does sustainably managing 100% of our oceans look like? As I said, they're vast. They're over, generally over the horizon. So this is a place you can't easily see. So it's not like um, driving through the Midlands and seeing development there. It's not like coastal aquaculture where you can see the fish pens out, out you know, in, the, in the water. We're talking well over the horizon generally. And so how do we go about managing something like that and something at the scale that the oceans are in? We've got aspects of marine spatial planning um, or marine planning in place already. For example, this is the network of Commonwealth marine reserves. So just step back a set. Under our federated system of government, the state, the jurisdictions, the states are responsible out to the edge of state waters. So that's generally three nautical miles out is managed by the states. From where that three nautical miles ends out to the edge of the EEZ, which is the sort of the dotted line, is managed by the Commonwealth. So that just gives a sense of there's quite a lot of marine parks or marine protected areas, I should say, out, out in, our, in our, our, our oceans. And that's part of whatever management system we have for um, the oceans of the future has to respect those um, marine protected areas or marine reserves. And they're re protected for different reasons or managed for different, different outcomes. I won't run through that. But that's, a, that's part of managing as, uh, the oceans. But it gets a lot more complicated than that, as you would appreciate. The bottom right-hand side down here is just a map. I think it was from 2016, I think, which is essentially a heat map of boat movements um, around Australia. And AMSA produces these sort of mapping products on a regular basis, and you can see them in real time if you're really interested. But what you can see is there's, not surprisingly, a lot of traffic in our oceans. And so marine spatial planning needs to take into account things like transport. On the far left, I've just pulled a small part of Australia, the Gippsland Basin, or ba the Gippsland Basin part of Bass Strait, just to show you the complexity that's planning already there for oil and gas. And you can imagine if I was to show you the northwest, uh, the northwest of Western Australia, it is that many times more complex. So there's a lot of activities that already occur in our oceans and that are planned, but there's very limited, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, coordination of planning between the various sectors. And when I was writing this talk, I thought it came up with about 16 different um, legitimate users you'd need to plan for in, um, uh, in a marine spatial planning exercise. And the Blue Economy <coughs> CRC is very much doing this at the moment. So we are developing a marine spatial planning tool that pulls together all of the different competing and complementary uses in our oceans into a multi-criteria decision support system so that will enable governments to, or particularly in this case the Commonwealth Government, to start allocating space within the oceans. So as our new industries come along, like offshore renewables and like offshore aquaculture, they can slot into a planning system that's already considered the other users out there. One of the impediments that I've experienced in my previous role as, as Secretary of the PIPWI was trying to get aquaculture into the Commonwealth waters, the oil and gas sector was very concerned that they were already there and they didn't need another player in the space. So enabling um, new industries to come in requires the existing industries to feel comfortable that they're going to be, um, their needs are also met as part of a new planning system. 
But what I was going to show you in the next one is that um, one of the things that's not been thought a lot, about, a lot in the oceans as part of a planning perspective is what is the interest of First Nations, uh, the, Arab, the Aboriginal people in, in oceans. We're doing a lot of work in Bass Strait at the moment and it would be easy to dismiss the ocean as being a place where um, there isn't a particular interest of the of First Nations people. I do a lot of work in New Zealand as well and it's a very similar story there. And if we take, for example, Bass Strait, it wasn't that long ago that it was a a land bridge between Tasmania and the mainland, and that was actually one of the major migration pathways um, for, for, for many, 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 many millennia. And so um, understanding that and then understanding how do we incorporate sea country into our, into our planning is a real challenge, and we're investing quite a bit of time and effort and thought into that at the moment, into how do we do this. We're running that out of North, northern Australia because there's, um, it's a sort of the researchers that we've got in that space have a, a strong interest and in, in knowledge of that area, but it's equally applicable to, um, to Bass Strait. When spatial planning is done well, then it, as I said, it can provide a really good pathway to enabling industries to coexist and giving people confidence that, that the area is sustainably managed. And I've used um, an example of here of the Belgian um, marine spatial plan. Now it's a lot easier in Belgium because you've got this really tiny, tiny area, you know, three and a half thousand square kilometres as opposed to the nearly 10 million square kilometres we're talking about. But it's a very crowded space and they've done a really good job. And this is a very simple cartoon almost of an extraordinary amount of information that sits below this. But they've essentially, in much the same way we do with um, land planning, They've zoned or planned for areas for defence, for sand extraction, for offshore renewables, for navigation or shipping, for recreation, <coughs> excuse me. All of those competing values are built into a plan. I think when the Prime Minister signed up for his ocean plan, this, this is, I think, what he was signing up to. I'm not sure if he knows that yet, but, but to do that is going to be quite a challenge. Another reason for doing this, and I, I've, I've flagged it early on, and that is that it's because the ocean is out of sight for most people, but it is the commons, it is our oceans, how do we give ourselves confidence, how do we give the community confidence that the things that we're doing out there are being done well and done sustainably? How can we be proud of those? And we've seen the conflict that can emerge when, when an industry operates in the commons and people don't like what it's being done, and we can see that through. Um, it's happening in the forest industry. It's happening currently in the aquaculture industry. So I was just going to talk a little bit about some work that we're doing in this space: social license to operate. This is something that the blue economy uh, is spending quite a bit of time on at the moment, um, and this is being work being done out of the uh, Charles Samford at um, out of Griffith University in Queensland, and he put up this slide just recently at a, something that I was at, and I thought, that is a really good way of describing <laughs> social licence, and he did it by an analogy to the legal licence to operate. With a legal licence to operate, the key questions are, who issues the licence? Who has authority to issue it? Who gets it? Who holds the licence? What is it for? How long is the licence for? What are the conditions on that licence? What are the consequences for a breach of that licence? And on what basis are licences refused, revoked, or renewed? Now, if it's a, a licence to, um, for example, um, I don't know, operate a service station or you know, to, to pump petrol, or it's a licence to um, mine on land, those sorts of things are well thought through, and you can probably sit there and it's, they're pretty self-evident. But a social licence to operate, you can ask the same sort of questions. Who, who actually <laughs> issues the licence? The community. Who, what is the community in that contents, context? Um, for what activity? Quite clearly. But how long does the social licence operate last? And, and how, is, how, does it, how can it change? So, for example, I think if you went back 10 or 15 years, people might have been proud of the aquaculture industry as a general you know, view to average the community sentiment. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same now. 
And what are the consequences for breach? So what happens if you have a social licence given to you by community and you break it? What's the consequences of that? And how does the community make decisions collectively around refusing, revoking or renewing their social licence? So these, uh, we're doing some work around ethics and integrity in the ocean space to try and answer some of those questions. And one of the things that Charles Sanford um, was talking about, which I thought was a really interesting thing, is that um, this comes to um, what is social licence and what is a positive social licence. Does everybody have to love something for social licence to be granted? Do they just have to accept it? What if they're ambivalent towards it? How does that play out? And then obviously you've got people who actively resist something. And so I think this is a really good way of thinking about that concept of social licence. It's an integrating thing across you know, everybody in this room and everybody in the broader Tasmanian community. But as a company, if you're trying to operate in this place and you want to operate with a social licence, you have to have a pretty good idea in your mind what it is you're trying to achieve over on the, the left-hand side of this, uh, or on your, your right-hand side of that, that diagram. As I said, we're spending quite a bit of time on just trying to understand social licence in the context of the oceans. And one of the things that we're focused on is that, is scientific evidence enough in of itself to attain a social licence? And I think, just making this up right as I speak, but the vaccination um, debate that's currently raging in Australia is probably a good example on that. It's not just about what science says, it's there's something more to this. And so understanding that and building it into the way we think and manage and plan is going to be important. And this last dot point is very much about what I've been trying to talk about in this marine spatial planning place space. How do we, I can have all the technological exp, um, solutions, I don't, but to going out into the ocean, we can have the right regulatory environment for doing it. But how do we ensure that the community is comfortable and proud that we're doing it in the right way? So how do we build confidence and ensure transparency in what we're doing out in the oceans? And that's very much about the work that we're trying to do at the moment. I'm going to uh, sort of leave, leave you with those, some of those thoughts and move now to some of the more engineering side. I'm trying to cover off on a whole lot of different things we do in the Blue Economy CRC, but I, I thought understanding that the space that we're doing operating in that planning and, and social licence space is a useful place to start. As I go into uh, offshore renewables, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, one of the things that we don't have at the moment is a regulatory environment that allows the things I'm going to talk about. So once we get out of state waters into Commonwealth waters, the regulatory environment for aquaculture does not exist. So it's not, you can't legally farm um, aquaculture species, whether it's seafood or fin fish, in Commonwealth waters at this moment in time. And similarly with renewable energy, there is no regulatory environment to permit it um, in Commonwealth waters at the moment. So the things I'm going to talk about are things that there has to be a change of law in order for them to, to, to happen. One of the things the Blue Economy CRC is doing is working very closely with governments to help, hopefully, um, amend their laws. And that's one of the things that I, I do as part of my research in the Blue Economy is I help write legislation or draft legislation for, for governments. Um, if you do this, then this can be the outcome that we're, we're going to achieve. So, to wind. I apologise to Martin, because Martin sat through this, <laughs> some of this um, uh, webinar that we had earlier in the week, where we launched this report, the Offshore Wind Energy in Australia. It was, I think, uh, a, really, a really important point in the offshore wind story for Australia. So we teamed up with um, a consortium of unions led by the Maritime Workers Union. Uh, the ACTU was in the mix, as well as a couple of other unions and University of Technology Sydney and CSIRO. So we pulled together a team to understand, the reason for doing this was to understand, well, why the unions were interested, I should say, was to understand, well, what's the workforce potential in this emerging sector offshore wind? And they're interested in a just transition for their workforce from oil and gas <coughs> and coal into something. And so they're saying, well, is this offshore wind, is this a likely place where our, our, our workforce could end up? Are they good jobs? Are they well-paying jobs? And how many of them there will be? To do that, though, we had to understand the wind resource around Australia. And I'm going to talk about that. 
and then we had to understand what technologies would be required and are they available to, cap to, to use that wind resource and then we could start to work out what the, uh, the employment potential for offshore wind in Australia is. So it's uh, available on um, our website if you would like to read, read the report and I'll just touch on a few highlights from it. Around the world, offshore wind is grow installation of offshore wind is increasing um, significantly off a very low base. And uh, the International Renewable Energy Association um, predictions of uh, capacity, installed capacity over the next, between now and 2050, are on this graph. And uh, the US has got basically nothing at the moment. Biden has made a very strong pledge into offshore renewables, and that's reflected in, in this graph. Europe right now, if you were to fly over the North Sea, you would see a number, many, many offshore wind farms fixed, fixed to the, the, the substrate, fixed to the ocean floor, uh, wind farms. Asia, at the moment, you will see some there but the predictions going forward are enormous for, for Asia. For Australia, the um, predictions are basically nothing. Um, that was the, uh, I think it was 2019, 2020, I think was that, yeah, 2020, that report came out. I think Arena, Arena's got that wrong, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But the purpose of showing this is that offshore wind predictions by governments um, as, being, as part of their energy mix are going up very significantly um, over the next 30 years, predicted to. So what, what does our wind resource look like in Australia? And we, we, we Blue Economy CRC, mapped um, Australia's wind resource at, a, at a quite a fine scale. And on the bottom right, you can see the, the map of Australia with our uh, <coughs> mean wind speeds 100 metres above sea level, the wind farms that we use now the, in the oceans the, where the turbine is that 150 metres actually above um, the, the ocean now, this is how big these things are. But you can certainly see, and not surprisingly, in southern Australia and actually parts of North Queensland and on the west coast of Australia we have high wind speeds. Similar in speed to the North Sea which is sort of seen as a, an excellent world class resource. So on wind speed, our wind speeds are as good as the North Sea for, for offshore wind. But wind speed is um, only a part of the story when you come to um, uh, a wind resource. You also want to understand how um, consistent that wind is. So if your average wind speed is 10 metres per second, but it's 100 metres per second for some time and zero for a big lump of time, that's not a particularly great wind resource if you're trying to exploit it for um, generating energy. And so what the, the, is, you calculate is what we call the capacity factor, which is effectively, if you've got something that's rated at a certain rating, say a, it's rated at a megawatt, what does it actually run at averaged over a year? And so if it, runs at 50% efficiency because that's where the wind is played, it'll have a capacity of 0.5. As I'm, I'm sort of, Martin, you can <laughs> tell me it's a little bit more complicated than that, and I know, but that's a pretty straightforward way of trying to describe it. But what the purpose of this is, is to show you that the, the quality of the wind resource um, in, um, around Tasmania is very high by, by national and global standards. To have a capacity factor of, um, greater than 0.6 um, is extraordinary. On land, the best capacity factors are somewhere around 0 0.3, 0 0.4. The wind resource, once you get offshore, is both stronger and more consistent. And sometimes, I won't go into it here, it can be out of phase with the wind onshore as well. And so where offshore wind can, and we've done some work on this, it can fill some of the gaps that you get from onshore wind, depending on location and all those sorts of things. So then what we did is learn how to use the clicker, oh, we've done it, is to um, say, well, okay, it's all well and good having all that wind out there, but can you actually use it? Oops, and I've pushed it once too many times. I think it's slow, that's what it is. 
Um, so what we did was map where the um, current network is and the substations are. So if you're generating a significant amount of wind uh, energy somewhere, how do you plug it into the, the network? Um, that's quite an expensive thing to build these extension cords from wind farms to the network. And so we made some sort of rules around how far away from a, a place you can plug it into. Um, we've also looked at um, depth. Um, currently, with the fixed uh, wind farms that we see in the North Sea and around China and other places that are installed, they literally, it's not great quality, but they fix it through different mechanisms directly into the substrate. Once you get over about 50 metres of depth, that becomes impractical and very costly. The technologies that we're working on in the Blue Economy CRC with our, with our European partners are around floating technologies. And that's these sorts of things here. And once you do that, then you can get out to about 1,000 metres depth and you basically moor a floating platform with a wind turbine on it. So what we have done is mapped Australia and said, well, OK, you're within 100 kilometres of somewhere you can plug it in, um, in both shallow and deep water, the blue and the red, and then calculated how much wind resource was in those spaces. And the math says we've got 200 gigawatts in those coloured areas. And that's in the context of uh, current installed capacity in total of fossil as well as renewables in Australia of about 60 gigawatts. So we can see that the energy potential is significantly, significantly more than we currently use. I think that's a really positive and great story. There's a wind resource there that can be renewably, can be, can be harvested renew, um, in a sustainable way if we get all the settings right. And whilst I said in that first graph, um, which showed the projections of wind, installed wind around the world, and I was using the International um, Association's data, that actually is not really what's playing out. So currently in Australia, we know of about a dozen, I think, their projects that are in some form of uh, development around Australia for offshore wind. Now, as I said, there's no law yet to enable these to actually occur, but there is certainly um, what, 35 gigawatts of installed capacity on various books. Now, many of these will not come off, but some of them may well do. And these are large, large um, scale um, uh, operations, you know, two, three, five gigawatts. They're, they're, they're significant um, systems. One of the things about going offshore is that you can have much larger blades, so get a lot more power out of each turbine than you can on land. And one of the reasons for that is that we can start to build things in, on wharves and then float them out or ship them out and assemble them out in the ocean or start to assemble them on a, on a wharf and then tow them out. When the wing span or blade span is hundreds of metres, you just can't do that on land. So the current scale of offshore wind, the bigger turbines are up to 15 megawatts. The largest ones you'll see in Tassie will be three to five, Martin, somewhere around that. So, so they're five times the, the, the output per per turbine than you get on land. Anyway, so I'm going to sort of step away from, from wind, but I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of the work, some of the work we've been doing and where we see, see the future. I'll talk a bit now about aquaculture and particularly around uh, salmon, salmon production. So the global salmon uh, market, this is one of the international organisations that maps demand on a whole range of agricultural products, they are predicting the global salmon market between now and 2026 to grow by up to $46 billion from about $30 billion now. That's an annual growth rate of about 7.5%. That's what it's been doing for quite some time. That's not some wild prediction. It's almost like the status quo in growth for that, for that industry. Australia's salmon production um, was somewhere around about $800 million last financial year. So you can see, as a proportion of the world's salmon production, we are actually only a few percent. Um, we're not a major player. Nonetheless, demand in Australia is forecast to grow 
um, at a similar rate, and certainly that's the company's um, modelling would suggest that. And there are governments, both at a national and at a state level, have ambitious targets to grow um, salmon production in, in, in Australia. And salmon production in Australia means salmon production in Tasmania because our waters are the only waters that are cool enough to, to grow salmon um, at scale. So how can we do this? How can we meet these targets? And this, I think I've, you'd know what I'm going to say here. Um, it is to move offshore out into our oceans. So the current salmon production I'll call coastal. Um, some of it's in very high energy environments, but it is serviced from the, from, from the shore and it's, it is certainly within state waters. It's not within Commonwealth waters. So some of those areas are highly energetic, but they are still, I would classify as a coastal, a coastal aquaculture. So, I said, these are, this is what we currently do, and I've, I've chosen two companies. I could have chosen three, but I've, I've chosen two. So the bottom right hand is um, in Storm Bay, and that's um, the well boat of Tassals. And so, and the, what I really wanted to show you were the circles, the polar circles, where they actually grow the, the salmon. So. Pages for about 160 metres in, um, in circumference. Um, and they're the average size ones for, or the, the sort of production size one for Tassel, the human ones are slightly uh, larger circumference. That, those pens would be about 20 to 25 metres deep, uh, the nets. So basically, you imagine a, a large net that sort of comes down in a cone at the bottom. And that's currently how we grow salmon. We would have on a lease, which is what that is maybe eight, ten or so pens, and we grow um, fish in each of those, and there might be a, a few million fish on a, on the lease. That um, blue boat is the is the same as a well boat, and they actually um, use that boat to transport fish out, but they also have to bathe fish regularly in Tasmanian waters. We have a disease called AGD, amoebic gill disease, and in order to medicate the fish, they just pass them through fresh water for a short period of time and then put them back into the sea. And that's how you keep the amoeba um, under control. And so one of the complexities about moving offshore is if this particular disease is out there, which we're pretty confident it is, then how do you manage and service your fish? So how do you keep up that freshwater bathing? So they're the sorts of technological challenges about moving offshore. The other thing is you start to move offshore is that you have, um, it's obviously much harder to access your cages. Um, weather conditions are likely that you'll have less days of good weather to do work um, at sea. And so all of those things start to add complexity. The example on the right is uh, what's called a feed barge. Um, and that's one of Hewan's operations, again in Storm Bay on a slightly less sunny day. Um, the feed barge sits out there um, permanently and all the feed for the cages sit in that barge and it's blown out through feed pipes and fed into the cages. The actual management of that is done from an office back in Hobart for both of those companies. So they actually sit at these sort of desks with many, many screens, lots of video cameras and they're watching fish feeding and they're kind of pushing buttons to feed from that automatically from that feed barge to, to the pens. So that's what it currently looks like. In the, often in, in the North Sea, in, in Norway, they've started trying to work out how they're going to farm at sea, and the Norwegian government's put quite a lot of resources into incentivising R&D, which has led to some extraordinary examples of what the future might look like. Um, have Farm is perhaps, I think, perhaps the most extreme example of this. So moving out into the ocean, they once, they've taken, adopted the approach of We'll just make, we'll just reinforce and reinforce and just build this thing. It's larger than an aircraft carrier, it's 350 metres long, and the cage doing you know, it, the, the pens actually sit inside that structure. It's, it's like a ship's hull with holes all through it and a net inside. So that's one solution. That, that's actually out there at the moment growing fish in the North Sea. The capital required to build and maintain that is extraordinary. And if you compare that to the, those plastic circles that I showed you um, that we're using down here, it's, a, it's a, just a completely different um, system of production. 
very different system of um, how you'd finance it. Down here, the value in the cage, when you see that the ocean is in the cage, the value is the fish in the cage. So the cage is actually relatively cheap relative to the value of fish. Here, that superstructure is many, many, many more times the value of the fish in there. So you've got to get a lot of fish through that in its life cycle in order to start to pay it back. The other one is a similar, well, it's a completely different design, but a similar philosophy, and they've essentially make this thing a huge, effectively, concrete structure, which you have the, which keeps the energy out, and you grow your fish on the inside. We don't think that those technologies are going to work well here. We don't think that um, our systems of production are going to work with that kind of technology and that kind of capital. Mm -hmm. So we're doing research at the moment in how do we move offshore with a different pen design that doesn't go down the route of this kind of really high capital, um, heavy um, engineering approach. And so we've um, got some concept um, of um, pens that we're actually getting, um, we're actually patenting at the moment. Um, and our patent attorney says that we're not allowed to show anybody until we've done it. But, but what we're trying to do is take the best of those ideas out of these Norwegian um, examples but build them in a way which is much softer engineering, much lower cost, but will hopefully perform in the same way. So for example, this have farm, the big one on the right, essentially it's moored at the front and so it swings around into the weather. So as the waves are coming, you should always point into the waves like a boat, like, like you would with a boat. What we're looking at is doing a similar sort of thing, is, is have a single point mooring and have the way we design our cages swing on that. If you go down a few metres, the energy is a lot less than it is on the surface. And if you go down 10 metres, it's almost, even in a really stormy day, it's almost very lit little of that energy is there. So how do we have something that swings around on a mooring and drops down below the surface when there's bad weather and then pops back up again when the weather's good? So they're the things that we're designing into new cage technologies. And that's part of what the Blue Economy CRC is trying to do. This all comes back to, where are we going to grow our seafood in the future and how are we going to get these step changes in production? We think it, we can do it in Commonwealth or in offshore, which will require Commonwealth waters, which will require a regulatory environment to do that. It will require the community to understand what we do and believe in it, so we'll need a social licence to do that. But we'll also need the technology to do it as well, and so we're operating on all of those different fronts. But as you also go out there, and I sort of referenced this a moment ago, Days at sea, are, they're expensive, but there'll also be fewer of them. One of the things that we found with going into Storm Bay with, um, with, with the companies there is that those cages that you saw, those round circles, we're finding wear points on those that we didn't know were a wear point before. Um, so one of the things about Storm Bay is you get these big storms coming through and we can kind of engineer them to withstand those. But where we're really struggling is that the constant movement that you get there is just wearing things out more quickly. And if you wear out some of those points and they, they fail, you can lose all your fish overnight. So you've, you can lose millions and millions of dollars overnight. So we're working with the companies and we're doing experiments now, or we're doing building technologies to, with some of our partners to improve the durability of those those pens. And one of the projects we're doing is working with um, a company called Advanced Composite Systems Australia, who are, work with um, um, different composite materials and trying to design couplings and things that are still cost effective but just don't wear out anywhere near the rate that the normal ones do. Even things like we've designed something you can join two ropes together at sea in a way that maintains the strength of the rope rather than tying a knot, knots wear out. So you, so just even think, click things for joining ropes together. So we work at the very large scale, but also doing some very tactical things as well. But the purpose of this slide was to say that one of the things that we're looking at doing and working on is how to remotely do things um, rather than having somebody sitting out there. And this isn't some work that's been done. Um, all the companies use videos to monitor uh, their fish for feeding and, and fish behaviour for feeding. But can we use that imagery and then work out other things? And one of the things that has been a problem for finfish farmers are jellyfish. And um, down in um, the channel, Hugh and I think 
in their annual report said they lost something like 18% of production to jellyfish um, in the last month's report, so that'd be a year and a half ago. This is um, using um, some machine learning to train your computer to look for jellyfish in amongst a sea of fish. And it's actually very hard to do, <laughs> but um, they've um, been able to do that now, and a group, um, a person called Kylie Pitt is the lead on that, out of Queensland again. So they've trained the cameras to look for jellyfish, and when they start to see jellyfish, then the companies can then institute management around feeding and various other things to mitigate the jellyfish being there. What we're now doing is saying, well, okay, well, we've, we've, we've cracked that nut. What are some of the other things we can do using uh, machine learning in these videos? And we're just about to, we're looking at doing some work where we're working with the three companies where the cameras are so good you can actually start to see the gills and how the gills are functioning in the fish. And by doing that, you can start to understand fish condition. And so then we can get ahead of fish health and fish growth by continuously measure, measuring the, how the gills on the fish are, are responding to their environment. So we're doing work in that space as well. So this is all part about going offshore. It's, it's also about building the technologies, but it's also about how do we do it as remotely as possible. And I realise I'm probably getting close to time, so I'll, I'll go through the last part. One of the things I'm going to now try and do is tie together some of the stuff around renewable and some of the stuff around salmon, just to sort of round out some of the story. Now, seafood production actually uses a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fossil fuels at the moment, and I'd, I only put this on because I was staggered by the number. This is uh, 2014 data, but I've talked to a company that prawn, uh, harvests prawns around the world, and it's, the numbers are still relevant. They use 7,000 litres of diesel for each kilogram of tiger prawns sorry, each, each tonne of tiger prawns harvested. So seven litres of diesel for one tonne of tiger prawns. The guy that owns that company, well, the, I shouldn't say he doesn't own the company, the CEO of that company, many people own the company, um, knows that that's just not sustainable. Um, and his company plants vast areas of trees to try and offset um, that carbon. But they're looking to say, well, how do we do this without using uh, diesel? And one of the opportunities is in hydrogen, and we'll come to that. But anyway, farm salmon actually has a relatively low carbon footprint compared to um, our terrestrially based species, but the companies are looking for ways of effectively having a zero carbon footprint over the sort of medium term. And so that's part of one of the things that we're working on. This is where the renewables start to click together with aquaculture. So, Put this slide here, and when you've seen the photo of the feed barge from Huon already, but that is where the fuel is effectively used on an aquaculture lease. Boats to and from that, and then running, running that. And from that they run their feeding, they run venturation, they run um, lighting systems. So they've got generators on them that chew through diesel at the moment. So one of our pieces of work has been to understand what the power requirements of an offshore aquaculture lease are, what's the timing of it and all that timing of use of power. You'd think it was known, but actually it turns out the companies don't really know that. They just chuck diesel on the thing and just let it run until they need to fill it up again. So we've been doing a lot of work understanding how these things operate. But if you could imagine we could couple an offshore renewable technology, and I've just given the little yellow windmill on the left, is a company called Satex uh, Prototype Pilot um, Turbine. We nearly bought that to Tasmania, but we didn't quite get enough money together to do it. But we're looking to bring a much larger one here. Um, that's just a small pilot. That's a floating technology. But if you can have something scaled a little bit bigger than that plugged into that feed barge, you can then start to see how you might have something that's the beginning of a decarbonised aquaculture production at sea. And if it, using a bit of a cartoon, and the grey is very, very light, so I forgive me. We can imagine, you can almost imagine a hull of the barge that runs along. And we've got a whole bunch of things that um, consume electricity, sorry, consume power. And then currently, we have a generator, and that's the, the loop. But what we're looking at doing now is building in um, components on these barges that will hopefully displace the generator in time. 
at the moment I've got something called a, P a power takeoff unit to a piece of rope going into the water, and I'll explain a bit more of that at the very last slide that we do. But if you could imagine, rather than a PTO there with a weight, what's going to be a wave energy converter, it could be any form of renewable. It could be floating PV, floating photovoltaic cells, it could be offshore wind, it could be wave, it could be tidal. The hydrogen bit is something that we're doing a lot of work on in the Blue Economy CRC at the moment. We have currently um, have what's called an electrolyzer, the bit that splits the water into hydrogen and oxygen uh, being assembled in Germany and that'll be landed in Tasmania around Christmas time and commissioned in the first quarter of 2022. Our, aim, our research aim is to put the electrolyzer on a barge hooked up to renewables, hooked up to an aquaculture system. That's one of our our aims. To do that though is technologically really complicated. The electrolyzer that we're getting is a commercial scale one, it's a 700 kilowatt device. Um, if it was running in Australia right now, it'd probably be the, probably the second biggest in Australia. It is enough to produce hydrogen for, it's about 260 kilograms of hydrogen a day, which would be enough to run uh, probably a dozen buses doing 400 kilometre routes or something like that. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a commercial scale. It's not, it's not the sort of scale that's being talked about at Bell Bay, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly a commercial scale. It sits in, um, it'll be delivered to us in 20 foot or a little bit bigger shipping containers, but there's a lot of work to turn that thing that's been designed to sit in a very nice, stable, dry bit of concrete slab in wherever to having that operating at sea in a barge. So we're doing a lot of work at the moment to, well, we, we're doing the thinking now and we're starting to build the electrical control systems behind this to take it offshore. And I won't go into the slide a lot, but it's a fairly significant part of our work is how do we build effectively a hydrogen microgrid to drive all those things that, 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 we, that we want. Um, and that's some work that's currently afoot. What I was going to finish on is this uh, conceptual, <laughs> it's a photo with some concepts put into it, but how we might pull it all together. And Martin spent many hours in the last week and a half as Martin Reynoldson is um, on our scientific advisory committee and led some of the thinking around deciding whether or not this is a very good idea or not. <laughs> so, but I'm going to take you through it. So that's a current feed barge. What um, We've, Carnegie Clean Energy, which is one of our participants, are building a, an underwater wave energy converter. And the way they do that is they've got a big buoy that sits under the water and it's tightly moored to the, the surf, to the sea floor. And it's the sort of the movements of that buoy going through, a, through the mooring line with a power takeoff that they're using to generate electricity. With a bit of a brainstorming session, it was thought, well, why don't we use that same technology on an existing feed barge? So these things have to be moored, they're in an energetic environment. Can we take that heaving motion that would otherwise have to be kind of lost through, you know, stretching and straining and whatever, and have a PTO on the boat so that these, way, these um, feed barges actually generate their own power in effect? And so that's a piece of work that um, we're just about to we haven't entirely decided to, but we're almost pretty much across the line looking to um, do quite a bit of work in. So hopefully in five years' time, if I was to come back here, I'd better show you how you could go onto the website and order your next feed barge with its own power generating system. And in about eight years' time, it would have not a diesel generator in there, but would have um, a hydrogen system with a fuel cell or a turbine, a micro turbine or something to turn that hydrogen back into power. And one of the really good things about hydrogen in these offshore environments is that the byproduct oxygen is absolutely critical if you're trying to do a um, aquaculture industry. Currently, aquaculture is, along with medical uses in hospitals, is the biggest consumer of oxygen um, in Australia at the moment. Uh, sorry, in Tasmania at the moment. And with that, I will pause and hand over to you. questions and I think there will be many. Um, I would start off by suggesting that one of the difficulties that in getting a social license it relies on aesthetics. 
that um, people worry about what it looks like. When things are out of sight and out of mind, um, people put up with them, no matter how bad they are. But when um, wind farms start to appear offshore in Europe so that they, there's no longer the, the open sea to look at, people worry about it. If uh, we imagine uh, wave generators bobbing around off our favourite beaches, there'll be people starting to complain, as they now are about the, the fish farms. Um, how much do you think that um, issues like that are important, or will be? Oh, I think they'll be absolutely important, um, and that's why we're trying to understand now what are the things that are important and what do we do in their design to to ensure that we give confidence to the community that they're, they're sustainable. Now, visual amenity is something that is really hard to mitigate against. You can keep colours to a neutral palette, you can do various other things, but if you're sitting in front of a, a wind turbine that's one kilometre from your place, it, you can't hide the fact that it's there. One of the things about the ocean, though, is that you don't have to go that many kilometres out to sea before you start to go below the horizon. And so, for visual amenity, um, being out over the horizon, that might not be such an issue. Um, but there are other issues around um, social licence as well as, as visual amenity. And so we're trying to do the work now so that we can build systems that, or processes and, I guess, communication materials that give the community confidence that these things um, are, are positive. And if we can put it in the context of, well, we can decarbonise the world, we can remove our reliance on fossil fuels, we can actually do something about the amount of CO2 we put into the atmosphere, this is what it looks like, and then start to build that narrative into a social licence discussion, I think it's going to be important. Uh, i just got one question from our Zoom participants. Um, just generally speaking, how do jellyfish affect salmon production? <laughs> There's a couple of things, um, and I'm not a jellyfish uh, expert, and nor am I a, a, a salmon veterinarian, but the, the, the two ones that um, come immediately to mind is the jellyfish can actually get caught up in the, the neck that sits around the, the, um, the pen, and that can reduce the amount of water flow through the pen, and then you get issues with um, just oxygenation in the pen, because the oxygen is consumed and there's poor limited water exchange. So one of the issues is the distance quite literally the jellyfish acting as like plastic bags almost and, and stopping circulation in the pen. And the other is that the jellyfish themselves um, can irritate, some of the species of jellyfish can irritate salmon um, directly through, through um, their stinging. Thank you, John. Um, Yeah, so um, it's a really good question. Uh, so effectively, one of the things that we look at is the levelised cost of energy. So over the lifespan of a piece of equipment, what does the cost per whatever unit of output you want to measure it in? Um, offshore wind um, at the moment is more expensive than onshore wind to install. But the UK has been doing some work, and I, I, I didn't have the slides up here, but they've looked at the, um, what they're forecasting, the, um, the LCOE, for offshore wind relative to onshore wind, and it's not very far away that, they've, that they'll cross over. And that's because, one is that the, the costs of onshore land, of getting an approval up and getting the, the consent on land and all the other things associated with that is getting harder as space becomes more restricted. In the UK, that's obviously more of an issue than here. Um, but also the um, scale that you can build these things, so the actual turbine size, so I said they're up to about 15 megawatts now, that's uh, th three to five times more than the terrestrial equivalent, so you get, start to get to those economies of scale. And you can get larger arrays, so your network costs to connect, uh, so, you know, you're getting a lot more power into your network for the, for the effort. So all of those things combined, plus um, as the technologies evolve, the first one's always the most expensive, as you can imagine. The LCOE is forecast, certainly by the UK, I've forgotten what their energy administration was called there, to, to cross over in the not too distant future. I think in Australia at the moment, there's a lot of um, scepticism I mean, within the traditional energy industries about offshore renewables. Um, I think that's why you see it in those sort of forecasts um, of what's going to happen in Australia. But flipping over, you know, 
there's there's a great potential there, and I I, I see the other. I ask the question because yeah. It is. It is. And it's going to be, I think it's probably... They are impressive by flying 30,000 feet over the uh, farms off Denmark and you can see the pellets. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. And there, you can imagine those now in 1,000 metres of water tethered. The technology to keep the, that thing sitting nicely in the ocean is the stuff that we're doing with SATEC at the moment. Thank you for that. A fascinating uh, talk. Um, so many things need to... Uh, mesh together for a success to be viable. It's uh, going to be a bit stressful for everybody, I would suspect. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, is James Cook University part of the uh, blue economy? And if it is, is that a concern to you? <laughs> so, no and no. <laughs> no, JCU is not a, not a participant. Um, I actually do, if I just go through here, because that's who our participants are, and JCU is not on there. Um, yeah. Our participants, just as a little bit of how CRC works, so we call them participants, they're effectively, part, effectively partners. All of those institutions and companies put money and other resources into the Blue Economy CRC, and then we expend it with those. We occasionally do work with other groups, and I mentioned um, the the consortium of unions, so we do have the capacity to work with outside groups, but most of our work is directed by our industry partners and the, the research capacity that sits within the, the uh, research institutions. And my role as CEO is to try and marry those, those up, problems with solutions. Okay, my second question is, at what point is the growth of wind farms going to prolong our day? <laughs> okay, I might hand that to hand that to Mahan. <laughs> I don't think you, you're talking about changing the speed of the output, though. I'm talking about the fact that the, the wind farms are transmitting force to the earth. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, can I get that? The the the, that force is resisting its attempts to turn. And uh, in how many years will our uh, 24 hour day become a 25 hour day? I suggest not in my lifetime. <laughs> a good question. I have absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. I'm just curious about the, um, the technology. If you've got 150 metre tall um, turbine out in the ocean with bloody great blades at the wrong end of a bloody long lever. Uh, how on earth does one stabilise that? And second, what does one do by way of an extension cord? Is it indeed an undersea cable or something? Or Yeah, yeah so answer the last bit. For, there's two, two solutions, and I, I've talked about grid connected, so a bit like Basilink cable, you know, submarine cable, and that's how they, they do it now. One of the things that um, we're not directly doing, but some of our research will hopefully inform, is actually producing hydrogen at sea at point of generation. So one of the things that we've sort of had some very loose discussions with, and we haven't progressed these very far, is that there's a whole lot of oil and gas infrastructure out there that's being decommissioned over the next 5, 10, 20 years. It's very expensive to decommission it. If you can repurpose it, so put an array of uh, wind turbines around it, and then have uh, the hydrogen generating capacity sitting on the old platform, then you can then essentially export from there to wherever you, you want for hydrogen. So you would, so this is kind of, this is a 10 year sort of vision, but certainly there are, the R&D is now starting for that at scale, at sea production of hydrogen linked to offshore renewables. But the way that all the ones I showed you on the slide are, are, are all grid connected, and that's why we use the 100 Ks um, from a, an existing network as a bit of a, uh, a filter on, on what we see the potential. Um, blue energy, of course, osmotic power. Is that something in your... Um... No, not at all. No. <laughs> Too hard? <laughs> no, there's just unlimited things for us to work on and we're just focused on those things that our partners want to work on. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this, I think it's Richard and then, and then you. Um, what about tidal energy? 
that's visually not quite good and be close to the shore. Have you got any? Yeah, so Sabella, which is on here somewhere in the middle on the second row down, is a company that does um, uh, large uh, turbine installations and they've got a large one going in off the coast of uh, France at the moment. Um, absolutely, um, uh, you can certainly generate a lot of power out of, out of those large tidal turbines. Um, Irene Penesis, Professor Penesis, who's um, my research director, um, has you know, previously, before she's taken on this role, has actually mapped the tidal resource around Australia in the context of the sort of capacity or the sort of tides you'd need in order to, um, to run one of those larger ones. And we've certainly got good tidal resource um, in Bank Strait area off the northeast. We've got a good tidal resource um, out um, on, in the far northwest. Um, and We've also got a really good tidal resource in the north of, off of, <coughs> off of the north coast of Australia as well. Um, it's technologically really challenging to m maintain that kind of infrastructure underwater in seawater, and so certainly its cost is, is high. So it's a very reliable, very predictable, which is great. You can predict the tide 10 years out from now. Um, um, but its cost is high. So we're certainly working on those technologies. Co-locating with aquaculture is going to be problematic because the tides required to get enough power are not great places to grow fish. Your fish become very, very fit, but not grow very well. <laughs> so, uh, um, but we know there was a small turbine, you would, you would know this, Richard, installed under the Batman Bridge. Um, and Irene, was that was part of one of her projects. And so we're, we're looking at that, but that's, uh, um, I, I see the, the, the shorter term future I see as offshore wind. But if you're in the right place at the right time for a small island community, look remote with a good tidal resource, then, then maybe. Mm. One more. Was there a question up the front here? And there was one down here, and there was one at the There's two questions, I, I think, this man, gentleman here. <coughs> now, the University of Tasmania, or CSIRO, is government money, which is taxpayers' money. So do you know how much money we need? <laughs> I don't think you do. Well, I think the question is pretty open. I know how much money um, we use in our R&D, and I can tell you our budget's about $330 million over a decade. Um, <coughs> at the moment, I hope to grow that considerably over the life of the CRC. That, of course, will go nowhere to producing one of these large-scale offshore wind farms or an offshore aquaculture facility. So the companies that are actually going to be running these things are going to find a lot more, lot more capital. But as an R&D organisation, that's our budget. Um, we are one of many players around the world doing this kind of R&D. Um, and so to your question, I'm not quite sure where you're going, but I, I can, I, I, to build these things is going to cost a lot more than the R&D that we're doing, but that's our budget. Well, Dr. Whittington, um, we're delighted to find that somebody is thinking about everything from jellyfish to hazards of navigation and uh, so many different competing interests and competing needs for the use of the sea that somebody has uh, got the breadth of vision to look at all of it. Um, that is vastly reassuring at a time when people are not very reassured about what's happening around our oceans. We'd, we'd thank you very, very much for your, your talk to us. It's our practice to um, present you with a certificate to uh, mount on your wall to mark the fact that you spoke to us <laughs> and to present you with a copy of one of the um, Society's elegant publications. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much.